but maybe it's better that you just listen. So for the rest of the class today, about 15 minutes here, um, I wanna talk about the project and also talk about some content in the project that you could be tested on for the exam two next Wednesday. So we, the gateway is now gonna be on Friday. We should continue practicing for that. The exam two is gonna be next Wednesday. After the gateway on Friday, we will start reviewing for the exam. And then we'll continue reviewing for the exam next Monday. <clears throat> I'll put up some sample exams, <clears throat> excuse me, with answers, not necessarily to all the problems, but to most of them on Moodle. The exam will be a, basically about chapters two and three. Okay, That's basically what it's about. With the project, I'm trying to emphasize not really Mathematica uses so much as math itself. And the Mathematica is, <clears throat> excuse me, necessary to do what I want you to do, <clears throat> excuse me, especially with those graphs, because it's tough to make those graphs by hand. But really the, the, the key ideas, the math ideas are more important. And also to emphasize that math, you can do a lot of exploring and conjecturing in math. That's another thing that I'm trying to emphasize. Exploration, conjecturing, testing, kinds of things you do in science and engineering can be done in math without doing proofs. You know, there's a place for proofs, but there's a, also a place for not doing proofs. In a sense of observing interesting phenomena is another thing that I'm trying to emphasize. Remember I said at the beginning of the semester that my brother, he's a, he's a vice president um, at Optum Consulting, which is part of United Health Group. And I said that, <clears throat> I asked him a number of years ago, what are you looking for in your new hires? You're looking for certain technical competence, you're looking for good communication skills. And yeah, he said those things are important, but he said the most important thing is learning how to learn independently um being unafraid to try new things and see what happens test things and explore then that's what i'm trying to emphasize that's the the meta themes that i'm trying to emphasize with this let's talk about it first with the calculator and this is in the reading in the first couple sections of the project just experimenting with iteration applying something over and over again for example if i take a number like 0.99999 and I square that number like this and continue re-entering that, I can observe what happens. I can observe that the numbers get smaller and smaller. Yeah, when you square a number between zero and one, it gets smaller, right? 0.5 squared is one half squared, which is one fourth or 0.25. These numbers keep getting smaller and you keep hitting enter enough they're moving pretty slow at first, then all of a sudden they speed up like right about now. Now they're speeding up in their downward trend and pretty soon they're really, really close to zero. Now you got, this means like, for example, 2.676 times 10 to the negative 15th power, really, really close to zero. Do they ever equal zero? Not technically, though the calculator rounds it to zero that is rounding, technically speaking, they never actually equal zero. But it makes sense based on this observation to say the iterates, call these numbers the iterates, approach zero. That's what we're observing. On the other hand, if I type in a number just barely bigger than one, and then square that number, I can observe that those numbers get bigger. Slowly at first, but once again, they speed up. Another interesting thing to note here is that it's like the decimal keeps doubling, right? You see the 32 and then the 64 and then the 120, well, rounded to 129. Effectively, it's like you're doubling the decimal part here when you square. You might wonder why. Actually, linear approximation can't explain that. And all of a sudden, once you get up to two or so, then they increase very, very rapidly. And now we're into positive powers of 10, 3.44 times 10 to the 45th power. 
1.18 times 10 to the 91st power. Did you know that 10 to the 91st power is way more than the number of atoms in the observable universe? Seems weird, you know, the Avogadro's number is what, somewhere in the ballpark of 10 to the 23rd? You would think 10 to the 80th is not so much bigger than 10 to the 23rd that it would be bigger, big, the same as the number of atoms in the universe, but it actually is, at least according to estimates that I've found. Estimates for the number of atoms in the observable universe, not the number of galaxies, not the number of stars, not the number of planets, not the number of rocks, but the number of atoms in the ballpark of like 10 to the 80th. When I say ballpark, it could be anywhere between 10 to the 75th and 10 to the 85th. And that is way, 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 way bigger than 10 to the 23rd. Okay. That's what happens with scientific notation. Anyway, these numbers appearing to be going off to infinity. We eventually reach an overflow in the calculator. You can observe that they're going to infinity. If the seed, the starting value is one and you keep squaring, well, that stays fixed. One squared is one is one squared is one, et cetera. That's a fixed point. Because the initial conditions, the starting seeds that are close to one but not equal to one, go away from one as you keep iterating, that means one's what's called a repelling fixed point, sometimes called a source. The points are moving away, it's repe they're, they're repelled from one. On the other hand, zero is an attracting fixed point. Zero is a fixed point. If I square zero, I get zero. And I plug in numbers close to zero, they go towards zero. That's what we saw. It's an attracting fixed point. Why? Why is zero attracting and one repelling? That's part of what the, the cobweb plot code is supposed to help you understand, which I will come to. Ultimately, before you get to the Newton's method part of the project, you're dealing with this example. Iterating the function f of x equals 4x times 1 minus x. When you start with a seed, an initial condition between 0 and 1, it doesn't matter what you pick, pick 0.1, for example. If I do 4 times that number, that previous answer, the second answer here, times 1 minus that answer like this, and then keep hitting enter. It plugs the numbers into that function. It iterates the function. If I do it once, I get 0.36. Why? Well, 4 times 0.1 is 0.4 times 1 minus 1, 0.1 is 0.4 times 0 0.9. 0 0.4 times 0.9 is 0.36. Yeah, that's right. Do it again, you get 0.9216. Do it again, it, it goes down. There's no there's no clear pattern here, and there doesn't seem to be settling down on a fixed point. The numbers bounce all over the place. Are there patterns? There are patterns. When the number is small, like it is now, it goes up. When the number is big, like it is now, it tends to go down the next time. That's especially true if it's close to, to one, like 0.967 goes back down to 0.126 if we get really close to one. Like 0.986, it goes close to zero on the next time. But overall, there's not much of a pattern. This, this actually has an official name. It's called chaos. And when you try to describe what's going on in that problem where you're dealing with this example, you can describe it as chaotic. Basically, no pattern, seemingly random. It's actually not random. It's what's called deterministic. The um, the values of the iterates are exactly dependent on the initial condition, the seed, with no randomness. But it just seems random. Let's talk about this with the Mathematica now. So you don't need to understand this. This is just code that I typed. Actually, I didn't make this up on my own. I found it from somebody else. That's going to define a function in Mathematica. Not a function in the usual sense like this, but another function. I'm, I'm calling it cobweb plot. It's got more than one input. All these things inside here are inputs for it. What do they represent? 
This first thing represents the function f of x, whatever that happens to be. This second piece with the curly braces is a list telling you what window in the x range to graph, the, make the graph over. This third win list tells you the y range, the y min and the y max. I probably didn't really need to put the x here and the, and the y there. I could have just gotten away with x min, x max, and y min and y max, but it's not a big deal. This one's the seed, the starting value, the x zero. And this is the number of iterates. You put your cursor anywhere on this line and enter it, seemingly nothing happened. But no, something did happen. Now, if you let f of x be cosine of x and enter this, you will see one of these cobweb plots. And the cobweb plots are meant to be informative if you understand what they're telling you. That's what I describe down here. I describe what it's telling you. Let me verbally just describe it with the picture here. Our seed was 0.1. That was the initial condition. If you imagine, you could imagine these numbers were maybe representing populations. Maybe, maybe they represent population of rabbits in uh, some big field in, in thousands of rabbits, say. So 0.1 would represent 0.1 thousand rabbits. That would be 100 rabbits. 0.995 would represent 0.995 thousand rabbits. That would be 995 rabbits. This would represent 544. This would represent 855. This would represent 656, et cetera. If this is a good population model for the rabbits, well, that tells you the rabbit population is jumping up and down every, you know, whatever, every year. How is it related to this graph? This red curve that you see here is the graph of the cosine. Of course, it's not the entire graph because the graph oscillates overall. It's the piece of the graph when X goes between negative 0.1 and 1.5. I could change these numbers. I could change this 1.5 to a one, for example, and it changes the graph. That's okay. You can try, you, you're trying to pick, pick a good window here. I could change the y max for y, I could change it to a two, and I get a graph like that. 20, and I get a graph like this. Okay, you can barely see it now. I forgot what it was before. One point three. This blue line is the line y equals x. Why is that drawn in there? Because it's helpful. You start with your seed, point one. This point right here where I'm pointing on the blue line, it's the line y equals x. The x and y coordinates have to be the same. They're both point 0.1. This is the point, point 0.1 comma point 0.1. If you plug that number cos uh, point 0.1 into the cosine function, when the input is in radians, you will get an output of point 0.995. That's the second coordinate of this point, right? That's how you make graphs. Plug in different values of x, find the corresponding y, plot the points with those coordinates. This point has coordinates 0.1 comma 0.995. If you now go over to this line y equals x, where the coordinates are the same, since the second coordinate over here is 0.995, it's gotta be the same second coordinate here because it's on the same horizontal line. This point's gotta have second coordinate 0.995. And since it's on y equals x, its first coordinate is 0.995 as well. And now if I go down to the red graph, that's like point, plugging 0 0.995 into the cosine function. I get a second coordinate of 0.544. That's the second coordinate of this one, 0.544. If you go over there, it's about 0.544. If you go to the blue line, now you're at a point whose both coordinates are 0.544. Plug 0.544 into the function, you go up to the red graph, you'd be here. The second coordinate of this point is the 0.855. And if you do this process of starting on the blue line, going up or down to the red graph, in this case, we go up, then left or right to the blue line, in this case, we go to the right, then do it again, we go down to the red graph, left to the blue line, up to the red graph, right to the blue line, left down to the red graph, left to the blue line, et cetera, you're forced to head toward that point where those intersect. There's no way around it. You're gonna to spiral toward that point. 
let me do more than five iterations. Let's do 10 iterations. So you go closer. You are spiraling toward a point whose coordinates are close to 0.73. You're spiraling toward a fixed point of the cosine function. And since you're going toward it, it's attracting. What is that exact fixed point? Well, you can't really write it what it is exactly because it's going to be an irrational number. If you tried solving this equation in Mathematica, it actually doesn't work because it can't be solved with usual kinds of methods. You can approximate it. It's with something called fine root, but you have to give an initial guess. I'm guessing x is close to 0.73. The true fixed point to six decimal places is 0 0.73085. If I made that my seed, so I copied and pasted this code, which is fine to do down here and made my seed 0 0.739085 and enter this, it stays fixed and I don't see any lines. Well, there is a line, it's just a point. It's just staying at the fixed point the entire time. You're stuck there. Where the graph of the F function and the Y equals X line cross, those are your fixed points. Which has a lot of relevance for this example. This may be the first example you might've had the hardest time with. Make cobweb diagrams for this function. Hopefully you've noticed as you experiment, explore that the iterates approach the fixed point as n gets bigger. That can be approximated. There's actually two of them. One is easy to find, one's hard to find. I'm guessing this could be a point if you've been working on this where you found you couldn't find the one that's hard to find and you weren't sure what I was talking about. Let me give you some hints here. So plug in the function 0.1x squared plus 0.1 or plus one. Am I, am I picking a good window? I don't know. I might need to modify my window. Oh, and I didn't want to do a manipulate. The manipulate makes animations as the number of iterates keeps increasing. You can see the cobweb plot be animated. I didn't want to do that actually down here. By the way, to, to, to delete something in, something in Mathematica, like an entire cell, just click where I'm clicking here and just do a control X or command X to delete the whole thing. I didn't want to do a manipulate. Let me copy and paste this code. And let me change my function. 0.1x squared plus one, right? That was the one, yep, okay. Is this a good window? I don't know. Try it and see. Okay, I see a picture and I see these iterates approaching this point here, it looks like, whose coordinates must be 1.127 comma 1.127. That must be a fixed point. That must be the attracting one. Maybe I should pick a bigger window, like X go from say negative 0.1 to four or something and Y go from zero to four, something like that. I can see the same picture on that window. I can pick a different seed, like, I don't know, four. Now these points are going down toward that fixed point. Look at the numbers. I'm starting at four. That's the coordinates of this point right there, four comma four. I go down to the graph. The second coordinate of this point is the 2.6. That's at 2.6. Go over to the blue line. This point has coordinates 2.6 comma 2.6. If I go down to the red graph, the second coordinate is now 1.676. 1.676. And I'm forced in this case to staircase down toward that fixed point that seems to be an attracting fixed point that is again about 1.127. I'll do more iterations just to be sure. Yeah, 1.12702 seems good. But where is this other fixed point that I'm talking about? You got to experiment more. Don't be afraid to experiment more. Maybe I need to try other seeds. Maybe I need to try bigger windows. I don't know, negative. 10 to 10 or something. And maybe I need to try a seed of eight or something and see what happens. I get that picture. And hey, 
I'm noticing when I make a bigger window that the red graph crosses the blue graph here too. That's got to be the other fixed point. Looks like it's close to x equals nine. Let me try nine in here and see what happens. Well, nine goes off to infinity. See that? Those numbers are getting really, really big. Okay, well, then close. Maybe I should try 8.5. 8.5 goes down towards zero. Or not towards zero, but toward 1.127. Okay, maybe I should try 8.75. That's going down to 1.127. Maybe I should try 8.8. .8. That's going down to 1.127. 8.9. That's going off to infinity. This other fixed point must be somewhere between 8.8 .8 and 8.9. And you just got to keep experimenting until you narrow it down. How? Well, until it's close to being uh, staying constant. It's somewhere between 8.87 and 8.88. You just got to keep narrowing it down. This is experimentation in math. See what happens. I'm practically giving the answer away here for the other fixed point that's a repelling fixed point. Close to 8.873. Okay, there I'm being more explicit. A little bit smaller, maybe 2.5. Nope, that's a little too small. 2.7, etc. We're getting close. We're seeing. It's going down here, so I still need to make it bigger, but we're close. We're closing in on it. Got nine there. Try three here. Oh, we're really close. It's close to staying constant. That's what we're looking for is for the sequence to stay basically constant. Now it won't stay exactly constant, but you're trying to get as close as you can because the fixed point stays where it is. Here we talk about the attracting fixed repelling and repelling fixed point. Let me show you the chaos example. That's this one here, exercise 10. What do you see? Well, if your seed is not between zero and one, then you get errors because the numbers are getting too big here. Wow, 10 to the 49,955 power. You got to plug in seeds that are close to zero, between zero and one, like 0 0.1. And you need to zoom in closer to that so you see it better. <clears throat> 100 iterations. The points are going all over the place. Is there a fixed point besides zero? Yeah, there is. There's a crossing point. The red and blue graphs do cross here, but these points never get very close to it. Now you could guess approximately what that is. It's 0.7 something. And you could plug in a seed close to it, but it would be repelling and you'd eventually get a pattern like this anyway. Something else interesting to note. Okay, so that my seed here was 0.1. Notice that after 100 iterations, I'm at 0.372447. First, first lesson is that that's completely unpredictable. How would you how would you possibly know it would be close to 0.372447 without actually doing it? Secondly, watch this. If I change my initial condition ever so slightly, just add some zeros here and then a one, just an ever slight change in the initial condition. After 100, 100 iterations, am I close to 0.372? No, I'm pretty far away from it. That's 0.678. Even though this differed from my other initial condition by 0 0.000001, 10 to the negative six, one in one million, it produced vastly different behavior in the end, a vastly different prediction. 300 something rabbits versus 600 something rabbits. It's called sensitive dependence on initial condition conditions. And this, this makes a play, this comes up in the movies. You ever watch the old Jurassic Park one, the original? You remember the uh, Jeff Goldblum character, and they're in the, and they're in the car, the Jeep, and he's talking about dripping water on her hand and which way will it fall off? That's sensitive dependence on initial conditions. He was talking about exactly this chaos. How do you describe it? 
exactly exactly the kind of words I've been using here. It's chaotic, unpredictable. It's going all over the place, not settling down. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions. You can use those kinds of things. We can be flexible here on how you say it and still get full credit. I'm going to tell the graders to be flexible. There's no best way to say it. You're trying to observe things. For the test in this context, okay, you should know the basic principle about what's going on here. For the test in one week, if I tell you to iterate a function, you should know what to do. If I say let f of x be, oh, how about the sine function, sine of x, And if I say let x zero be one for your seed, you should be able to find the iterates. You should be able to find x one by plugging x zero into f. So you got to find sine of one. Whatever that happens to be, you should be able to find x two by plugging x one into f. Which also means you plug x zero into f and then plug that number into f again. This is really sine of sine of one. Function composition is what I'm doing. I'm composing a function with itself. One more, x3 is f of x2. That's f of f of f of x0 sine of sine of sine of one, et cetera. And you should be able to approximate these things. And the quickest way is with what I showed you before. Type your, your seed in there first, then plug into your function using the A and S feature. I can type sine, use the ANS second, ANS here. Sine of one is about 0.84147. That's what this is, about 0.84147. Okay. Enter it again. That's x2. That's about 0.74562. Enter it again. That's x3. That's about 0.67843. You should be able to do that. You should be able to describe what you observe if I tell you to keep doing it. What do we observe here? We observe these numbers keep getting smaller as I keep iterating the sine function. Going towards zero, possibly. Yeah, they are, but very, very slowly, actually. These are not going towards zero very fast at all. And in fact, the closer you get to zero, the slower it goes. It's kind of maddening, if such a thing made you mad. The closer you get to zero, the, the slower it moves towards zero. Look, please, I want to get to zero eventually. And it would take you many. If you kept hitting entry here until the calculator approximated it to be zero, I don't want to guess how many, well, maybe I do want to guess. How many times would it take you? I, probably thousands of times at least before the calculator would round it to zero. That's how slowly it's going towards zero. But zero is a fixed point. Sine of zero is zero. And it is a tracking, it's just very slow a tracking, not like the other example. Can I clarify anything? And when I, when I ask you, can I clarify anything? I really do mean it. I want you to tell me if I can clarify anything. Okay, let's spend the rest of our time in a oh, question. Yep, exactly. I just kept hitting enter. So just to, to confirm it again, one sign, second ants, just keep hitting enter. By the way, you actually can make cobweb plots in your calculator too. I'm not gonna show you how, cause it's a bit confusing other than to say that if you go to, um, I think it's the format menu. No. 
I haven't done in a while. Um, no, okay. I'm forgetting offhand. You can make cobweb plots in your calculator. You got to be in sequence mode. Maybe it's the mode. Yeah, you got to, in, in, if you press the mode and you go down and you're in sequence mode, and then you go to your Y equals screen, it'll look weird. Um, but there is a way to use this to make cobweb plots that I don't have the time to show you. Okay, if you're interested, you can look it up online or something to find out how to do that. But that's not required to for you to do that on the exam. You should understand what the cobweb plot is telling you, like I was talking about 15 minutes ago, but you won't actually have to make them. Do you have a question too? No, no? okay. Um, the other part is Newton's method. This, does, this did come up also, Newton's method. If you want more instruction on this in the lecture 17 that I had you watch before spring break, although most of you watched it after spring break, I talked about Newton's method. So if you want another review of it, you can look there, but I will talk about it here in our 18 minutes that we have left. Newton's method is a, is a way of finding roots, approximating roots. It is done by iterating, but not iterating the, the function f that you're after the root of. A different function, though it's related. Here's the general formula. So f, f is the function you're trying to estimate a root of. We'll, we'll do an example here as we go, partially by hand as well. Let's say we're trying to let's say we're trying to estimate square root of two. Now that can be done with linear approximation. And maybe we'll even do that on Friday as we start reviewing for the exam next Wednesday. But this time let's do it using Newton's method. Using Newton's method. Okay, these kinds of methods and maybe and some improvements of them that what that are what your calculator actually uses to estimate roots. There are actually even ways to improve Newton's method. Um, so what do you want to do? You want to come up with a, a simple function, though not too simple, that square root of two is a root of. Well, one simple function is x minus square root of two. That's the simplest function that x square root of two is a root of, x minus square root of two. However, that's not so useful because we're trying to approximate square root of two. And if we use that function to approximate it, we're, trying to, we're using what we're trying to approximate. So it doesn't really make sense to do that. Square root of two satisfies this equation. Square root of two squared is two. In other words, i.e. square root of two is a root or solution of the equation x squared equals two. And that's equivalent to saying square root of two is a root or solution or zero of the function f of x equals x squared minus two. Right, where this function is zero, well, one place it's zero is when x is square root of two. The other place it's zero is when x is minus square root of two. The graph of this is a parabola opening upward. Y intercept at negative two there. And x intercepts at plus square root of two and minus square root of two. We're trying to estimate plus square root of two here. And of course, if we can estimate that, then we can estimate minus square root of two. So how do you do it? do it with Newton's method? What Newton's method says is you iterate this expression. You use this recursive formula here. By the way, you computer science majors, recursive formulas you should know occur all over the place in computer science. Xn plus one equals Xn minus F of Xn divided by F prime of Xn. 
you use this equation over and over again. In other words, you iterate it. First, let n equal zero. That tells you x1 is x0 minus f of x0 divided by f prime of x0. Then use it when n is one. That tells you x2 is x1 minus f of x1 divided by f prime of x1, et cetera. You just keep going. And if we pick our x0 well, this will converge to the square root of two actually pretty rapidly. Now, square root of two is close to 1.4, but to keep things simple, let me try a seed of two. My initial guess is two. I, I need to use the function f. I also need its derivative. It is an application of calculus. Its derivative is 2x. f prime of x is 2x. So if I, if I use that equation here, I get x1 is, replace x0 with 2, 2 minus f of 2 divided by f prime of 2. Plug in 2 into the function and into its derivative. Plug it in here, you get 2 squared minus 2 is 4 minus 2 is 2. Lots of 2's here. Plug it in here, you get 2 times 2 is 4. 2 minus... Two fourths is two minus one half is three halves or 1.5. That is X one. Let's just use it one more time. And I claim we'll be pretty close to square root of two, even if we just use it one more time. There will be some error, but we'll be pretty close. Plug in 1.5 in place of X one. 1.5 minus f of 1.5 divided by f prime of 1.5. Remember f of x is x squared minus two. I need to replace x with 1.5. 1.5 squared minus two. 1.5 squared minus two is 0.25. Divide by f prime of two, 1.5, excuse me. F prime is two x. So f prime of 1.5 is two times 1.5 is three. 0.25 divided by three, about 0 0.08, well, 0 0.083 repeating. I get 1.5 minus 0 0.083 repeating, and that turns out to be 1.416 uh, repeating. Double check it here. And that, after just two steps, is pretty close to square root of two. Square root of two is 1.414. We're pretty close after just two steps. After three steps, you're really close. Now, I'm not going to do it by hand here, but let's try thinking about it on the calculator. What I'm really doing is I'm iterating not f itself, but some other function, g, but defined by this formula. I could call this g of xn, where g of x is x minus f of x divided by f prime of x. And if you plug in f of x, that's x minus x squared minus two over f prime is two x. That's the function I really wanna iterate here. <coughs> if I do this on the calculator, watch here. So I'm gonna try my seed of two. My initial not so great guess for square root of two, but not so terrible either. But, and then I'm gonna use the a and s again, but not with f, not with x squared minus two, but instead, this function, it's more complicated, but it can be done. Got to be careful. I could combine the fractions by getting a common denominator, but I think I'm not going to. So x is a and s minus, use parentheses, a fraction whose numerator is a and s squared minus 2 and whose denominator is 2 times a and s. <clears throat> oh, 
I had an A and S minus that in front of it. If I enter this one, I should get 1.5. If I enter it once. If I enter it a second time, I get, what was it? 1.416 repeating. Yeah, that's X1 and X2. Here's X3. Here's X4. Here's X5. It's the same as X4. And if you compare it with square root of two, they are the same two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places after the decimal. After just four iterations, we got nine place decimal accuracy for the square root of two. That's pretty amazing. Newton's method works really well a lot of the time, though not always. And to end class today, we'll talk about the not always. And we'll also talk about the graph that the Newton plot code made. Next. So here you've got code I've called Newton plot instead of cobweb plot. It is different than the cobweb plot code. This is different code. Not the same thing, and it doesn't produce the same kind of graph, though it's a similar kind of similar kind of thing, you might say. <coughs> Make sure you enter it if you forget. Here, let me let me quit the kernel, which is again what you want to do if you're getting errors and you can't figure out what the error is. You could also close out the notebook, but you got to re-enter stuff if you do that. So I'm quitting the kernel. That's clearing the memory. <coughs> if I just go down here and enter this as is, nothing will happen. Why does nothing happen? Well, it's because I haven't entered this code yet. I got to enter this little program before I can use it, before I can call the program. This is like computer science, computer programming here. This is a little, little function, a little program. Newton plot. Now I can go back down here and enter it, and I get a graph. I'm calling that function Newton plot that I made. I get a graph. This You pick your window for x and your window for y. That's what I picked, 1 to 2.2 and negative 1 to 28. You can see the graph. This red graph is the graph of x to the fifth minus 7. I, let's do x squared minus 2 instead. And start with the seed of two and make my y window smaller, say. <coughs> this is our situation. There's the 1.5, there's the 1.416 repeating. After one, two, three, four, five, six iterations, actually, these last two are the same to a lot of decimal places. This is not like the cobweb plot. You don't see the line y equals x, there's no blue line in here. It's just the graph of x squared minus two that's got a root at square root of two right about there. And what Newton's method does geometrically is it goes up to the graph, finds the tangent line at that point with slope equal to f prime of that point. <coughs> Excuse me. Finds the x-intercept of that line. And that's x1, 1.5. And then iterate, do it again. Plug it into the function, the G function. That means go up to the graph of F, find the tangent line, find this x-intercept. We're already really close to where the red graph crosses the x-axis. We're already really close to the root after just two iterations. You're forced to be. That's how this works. It's an application of tangent lines, linearization. I'll talk about it more on Friday. In the very last exercise, which is extra credit, Things will go wrong. You should not be surprised when things go wrong. These examples, weird things happen. One of them ends up giving you errors when you try to use the Newton plot code. I think it's the first one. Why? I'll go ahead and tell you it's because in this formula, back up here, with that example, you end up dividing by zero. So it says error, divide by zero. Can't divide by zero. I'll let you experience that. That's okay, just leave it the way it is. In the second one, uh, it won't settle down on the root. I'll just put it that way. Though the way it doesn't settle down is fairly simple. <coughs> this one, it also won't settle down on the root. 
But the way it doesn't settle down is very complicated, kind of chaotic. This involves a cube root here. It's actually best instead of doing um, something to the one third as your cube root, it's actually best if you type cube root instead for your function in the last part of the extra credit. It'll work better. Just telling you that you'll get less errors. You might get some errors if you just use the x to the one third. This is due by 11.59 p.m. tomorrow night. I was encouraging you to work in groups because I was encouraging you to want to discuss stuff together. But I'm not preventing you from doing it on your own. Make sure everybody's name is at the top if you are working in groups. And you're going to email it to me by 11.59 p.m. Um, in doing the experimentation, you may end up producing a lot of graphs. And when you produce a lot of graphs in Mathematica, the file size gets humongous many, many megabytes. I am fine with it if you just cut out your graphs, but leave your code in your solutions. You want to put your solutions down here. And, and by the way, do follow the directions and do enter stuff in blue and which you can just go, you can go to the palettes menu and get this writing assistant to show up here. And when you highlight your writing or your code, you can then color it blue, text color blue. That I want you to do and you'll get doc points if you don't, because it helps the grader find what you're doing. That's the, what, that's the reason I'm having you do it. So the grader can find what you did and what you didn't do, what was there already. But you can cut the graphs out. I'll tell the graders to count it as okay, as long as your code is there. Cut out the graphs to make the file sizes not too big. Okay. If you're still feeling confused, Office hours tomorrow is a great time. In fact, I've got my regular office hours 2 to 3.15, but I'm also going to be available all morning if you want to just feel free to stop by in the morning tomorrow. If you want to help, if you're having Mathematica troubles, right, lots of errors and you can't figure out what's going on, I can help you with that. Or math lab people can probably help you as well. And also work on studying for the Gateway on Friday. No regular assignment due Friday. Just this due by tomorrow night, Thursday night, and the Gateway Friday. All right. Have a good day.